Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the special Arts, Entertainment, Parks, and Los Angeles River Committee hearing. <clears throat> I am joined uh, by my colleagues David Rue and Curran Price uh, for this special committee hearing. And colleagues, uh, what we have, we have a few people who have uh, filled out multiple comment cards, including general public comment, and we'll, we'll start with that. Uh, and we have uh, Herman, Armando Herman, uh, as the first speaker. Mr. Herman, please step forward, and you will have um, two minutes for your items and one minute for general public comment. Such a grand reappointment for Ms. Sylvia Patasosoros. The Board Cunt of Recreation and Parks Commission. Congratulations, Cunt. Then we go into item three. Joint relative health and well-being of Billy. You know who Billy is. That's why the majority of people here talk about the <laughs> an elephant. The same fucking elephants at the zoo, they take that hook and pull the fucking elephant around like a dog. Roo, roo. Why don't we have elephants released from incarceration and concentration camps? Why can't we give this elephant sanctuary away from this fucked up city called Los Angeles, home of the fucking cunts? Then I go into the report of feasible Dixon, Dixie, Dixon study fucking recommendations regarding pedestrian. Well, I'm a pedestrian, and I fucking don't like walking around L.A. Walking in L.A., I don't fucking like walking around every day. So you see, the vicular issues are we are the hit and run capital of this fucked up world over fucked up bike paths over fucked up Garcetti, you put them in there simply to create more havoc. So if you're a dumbass senior or a stupid retarded like me who goes around riding a bike, beware. You cross the street, beware. Because some people here call themselves councilmen. No, I call them unfriendly pedestrian cunts. Now my general public comment is, no. we have Trump... No, it's no you're... There's, Mr. Herman, there's no general public comment during a special It's a meeting. special, so there's no... There's no general the public comment. Yeah. Actually, I misspoke. It is a special, so there is no general public comment. But you've had your two minutes to satisfy your items. And for anyone who has never been to a Los Angeles City Council hearing before, uh, we have to allow anyone to come in and say anything they want, as foul-mouthed or as ignorant as they may be or come across. And they interrupt meetings every time, as you're seeing. So. I apologize for the foul language that you just heard. It comes from a very, very damaged, emotionally damaged place. So uh, we all need to pray for him because he needs help. But it happens at every meeting, and we see this all the time. So I'm sorry that you had to be exposed to this if you've never seen it before, or even if you have, for that matter. All right, that brings us to uh, Eric Previn. Uh, and you have two minutes for the items, Mr. Previn. Uh, Eric Crevin from Studio City. I live in uh, CD2. And I, I, I caught on the agenda today that Ms. Uh, Sylvia uh, Patsaris is being re-nominated because I believe she's been serving on the uh, commission, the Board of Recreation and Parks Commissioners. And I want to say thank you for her service uh, to date. This is a family that has been committed to public life for a long time. They I believe something is named for them over at the Metro, so they are, they're helping. And uh, 
they oversee this group, the Board of Commissioners, uh, a lot of important things for the Parks and Rec Department, but also for some of the propositions like the 1996 Prop K uh, proposition, which earmarked for various locations around all the council districts, uh, projects of various types that Mr. Drucker could educate us about in great detail, but one that has plopped down in my district uh, in Studio City uh, was to upgrade the recreation center, uh, the actual park at Beeman. And what came out of the mix, unfortunately, was a giant, big, out of scale, add a giant basketball court where it's not needed. Because we have, the, pre the resource that we're protecting in Studio City is open space. So to put, uh, the pro project moved forward a little bit and then some money was shoved uh, down deeper into the project and they started building a larger, or scaling up to build a larger project in the center of our open space. So this became a great uh, burden on people's feelings about that. So what, what's also been happening in Studio City is right at the Weddington uh, Golf and Tennis Court, Harvard-Westlake has uh, generously purchased it and are going to be building something similar. So I'm wondering if uh, Ms. Pitsouris and the, her group, because I've been trying to get to their meetings, they meet in odd places, could see it in this next term to look closely at the Studio City Recreation Center. Maybe Thank scale. you. Thank you, Mr. Previn. All right, so colleagues, those are the only two comment cards on item number one. What I'd like to do, if there are no objections, is move item one now uh, on consent without objection. All right, thank you. And that is the uh, reappointment of Ms. Uh, Sylvia Petsoris to the Re Board of Recreation and Parks Commission. Uh, and that brings us, uh, what I'd like to do now is go a little out of order and go to item four, Mr. Morales. Item four, Mr. Chairman. Is a report from the Chief Legislative Analyst and the Department of Recreation and Parks joint report relative to the feasibility of the Dixon study recommendations regarding pedestrian and vehicular issues related to the Hollywood sign viewing areas. Thank you. And gentlemen, before we uh, hear your report, I'd like to do public comment on this as well. Uh, and it looks like we have uh, quite a few. It looks like we have about 16. Uh, and I'd like to start. Yes, you're welcome to stay or. Yeah, okay. Um, start with Christine O'Brien followed by Cheryl Veltri, followed by Paula Escott. Uh, and then you each have uh, one minute for your comment. Hello, Hello. gentlemen. Uh, Christine O'Brien, Hollywoodland. This study treats Hollywoodland like a fictional story, a set design made for a movie. It ignores key facts. There is a court order at the end of Beechwood. There was a traffic study on Beechwood submitted by to the court by a traffic engineer. The photos and lack of rack documents show that both vistas at Mulholland and Canyon Lake as illegal and unauthorized. There are no official sanctioned openings into Griffith Park from Hollywoodland, and all streets dead end into the park. They are substandard and without sidewalks. We are also in a severe hazard fire area and a significant ecological area. The main communication tower for the city sits on the top of Mount Lee. Your job is to assure public safety, not to be a cheerleader. Please remember the important role property owners contribute to make Los Angeles a viable city. Thank you. Thank you. Paula Escott, followed by Diana Knoll, followed by Barrett, I'm sorry, Garrett Shank. My name is Cheryl Veltry. I'm representing the Hollywood Land Homeowners Association, which represents 575 homes in the Hollywood Land Gifted Park, 444 acres given by the city by, to the city by the Sherman Company in 1944. We have consistently stated our position regarding the complex tourist and hiker issues related to the Western Griffith Park and Hollywood sign. One. Hollywood sign tourism has no place within residential R1 communities, and all efforts must be made to protect, protect these neighborhoods from tourist traffic intrusion. Two, Griffith Park access entry must be located only in areas that have sufficient infrastructure to handle both pedestrian and auto traffic. We are, are, we are equipped with facilities for vis visitors and should be situated to minimize intrusion and disruption of R1 neighborhoods. With that understanding, we are woefully disappointed 
in the continuing marketing of the historic but fragile Hollywood land neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paula Escott, followed by Diana Knoll, followed by Garrett Schenk. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If Councilman Rue is looking for a comprehensive approach to the problems of CD4, why wasn't Mount Hollywood Drive opened? Why wasn't it included in the mix? Special interest, perhaps? A good solution to the use of, would be the use of Forest Lawn Drive, with many flat acres of land that would accommodate parking for cars, trams, buses, and a visitor center, restaurants, restrooms. Why was it not considered? Special interest group again? Friends of Griffith Park? Let's save the squirrels and not the children in our streets. Thank you. Uh, Diana Knoll, followed by Garrett Shank, followed by Michael Morrow. Hi, good afternoon. I have been a resident of Hollywoodland for 69 years. What was once a beautiful place to live is now becoming an undesirable place to live. So instead of shutting it all down, you seem determined to make things worse by implementing some of the unhelpful ideas in the Dixon Report, in enticing thousands of more tourists into our neighborhood. These people need to be directed out of the neighborhood to a centralized location for sign viewing. You're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't work. It will backfire. A fragile neighborhood is not designed to be a tourist destination. And as the years pass, the neighborhood will continue to deteriorate further unless this problem is resolved in a sensible way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this Mr. Oh, is this, uh, Mr. Schenk? Correct. Yeah. Followed by uh, Michael Morrow, followed by Allison Starr. So I am opposed to this Dixon plan. Um, I'm a resident of the neighborhood. I walk my dogs on the street every day. There's no sidewalks. It's not a safe street. Um, I've actually almost been hit by a, si a city vehicle, not abiding by the, the stop signs there. So i 100% against this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Michael Morrow, followed by uh, Allison Starr, followed by Scott Freeberg. Councilman Rue, uh, honorable members of the committee, thank you for considering this. Uh, I've lived in Hollywoodland for 72 years on and off. I am essentially opposed to the measures that the Dixon Report uh, has put out. Uh, already, uh, our, uh, our, our peaceful neighborhood has uh, turned into uh, a very noisy uh, con conglomeration of, of tourists. I like the tourists, but uh, there's just too many. It's, it's becoming unwieldy. The report does not include the noise from overhead, the helicopter and the, and the small plane uh, uh, traffic that we have. Uh, that needs to be taken care of as well. Uh, it, the, this is untenable. It does not work. Uh, the, the proposals that have been made. Uh, this is not a business district. It's a residential one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Allison Starr, followed by Scott Freeberg, followed by Hope Anderson. Hello. Um, I'm a newer resident to the area. I've been here for a few years, but was there for the heyday when the gate was actually open um, and the ranch. And it was, again, untenable to use the word that that gentleman just used. Um, I was shocked in the first year of my residence there to see so many times when the street was backed up both ways. And there, are there have been you know, instances in my home and in other people's homes where they need medical help or police assistance, things like that. And emergency vehicles can't get up and down. Um, again, there are no sidewalks, so it's very unsafe for both pedestrians and the people who live in the neighborhood who are trying to take advantage of the streets to walk their dogs, things like that. And it just seems like there's got to be a better way. Um, it, it really is an untenable solution. And if the gate is open, I can tell you as a person who works from home and looks out on the street every single day, the time from when the gate was closed to the time from when the gate was open, the floodgates, it never stops. It truly never stops. It's hundreds of people every single day, and it doesn't really work for the, the landscape of the area. I'm opposed to this plan. Thank you. Uh, Scott Freeberg, followed by Hope Anderson, and then Sarah Jane Schwartz. I, I'm, I'm not a fan or um, support of the Dixon plan or study, but uh, everyone's uh, doing a very good job, and so I'm going to let them have their time. 
Thank you. Um, Hope Anderson, Sarah Jane Schwartz, followed by Lorraine Soch. Honorable council members, as a homeowner on Beach Beachwood Drive since 2005, I have seen my neighborhood taken over by tourists, both local and non-local, who regard Hollywood Land as a free amusement park where anything goes. Illegal smoking and the flicking of cigarette butts is popular among visitors, as is making ungodly amounts of noise through the night and during the early morning hours. Garbage dumping, including bottles of urine, is a frequent occurrence on my property. The historic staircase outside my kitchen window has been the site of public sex and defecation, as well as pounding feet in such numbers that the stairs are badly broken and in need of repair. Over the years, my neighbors and my appeals to the city for relief have been met with indifference, broken promises, and at times outright disdain. Los Angeles is determined to monetize Hollywood land at the expense of its residents, and the Dixon Report makes it clear. Running buses up Beachwood Drive toward hiking trails in Griffith Park, despite the fact that the Holly Ridge Trail entrance is illegal and finally closed. Building a bulb out on Beachwood Drive at Glen Holly to accommodate post. You can finish that last thought. Okay. Just finish to the last thought. To accommodate posers instead of citing them for standing in the street. Creating a Hollywood sign visitor center to further encourage tourists to come to the canyon. All of these measures will not only increase the unbearable tourist traffic that at times has trapped us in our homes and out of them, they also serve Th to thank, increase the risk thank, of fire. Thank you. Uh, all right, we have uh, Hope Anderson, Sarah Jane Schwartz, and then Lorraine Such. I'm Sarah Jane Schwartz and represent homeowners on Beachwood Drive United. We are against all promotion of tourism in Hollywood land because it's dangerous. Two different judges in the past year have ruled to keep the end of Beachwood closed to the public because of safety. The city even stipulated that there has never been a public entrance to the park at the end of Beachwood. The court then instructed that all public traffic be sent to the legal, public, safe entrance at Canyon Drive. Pedestrians literally in the street with shuttles and substandard streets don't mix. It's dangerous. So all references to Beachwood Drive in the Dixon Report, in conjunction with the Hollywood Trail, should be removed and replaced with Canyon Drive, according to the court ruling. If you ignore the court, you will be faced with prolonged litigation and a massive EIR for all of Hollywood land and other areas. You can't piecemeal in a project. Hollywood landers are tired of only getting representation from lawyers and judges. Councilman Rue, it's time for you to step up. Thank you. We have Lorraine, followed by Jim Van Dusen, followed by Tony Clark. I live on Durando, one of the streets that you take to the sign. Uh, we are totally inundated by tourists. On weekends, car after car after car, it's like the Santa Monica Freeway uh, walkers. It, something has to be done. This we must keep in mind is a fire area. And all we need is to have somebody throw a cigarette out the car. Something must be done and soon. We just can't put up with it any longer. It's just horrible. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Van Dusen, followed by Tony Clark and followed by Laura Davis. For the Dixon study, 7,000 cars pass through North Beachwood Drive between Belden and Westshire each day on weekends, which could also apply to Upper North Beachwood Drive. Anecdotally, I can state that summer weekdays can sometimes reach that number. There's an average of three people per car, which translates into about 21,000 people per day that can exit their cars. This does not count the number of people walking in the streets who come up by Dash or Uber. It will take a shuttle about 20 to 30 minutes to make a one-way run, and if the shuttle holds 10 people, it will take 20 to 30 shuttles running continuously up and down North Beachwood Drive to move any appreciable number of people. Shuttles would have to replace cars, and I'm not sure people will pay to ride the shuttle when they can drive and park for free. Basically, it would have to be cars or shuttles. It cannot be cars and shuttles, as a roadway cannot handle both. There is nothing in a strategy as how to restrict cars from entering the area, usually by shuttles, nor how to manage the shuttle traffic, breakdowns, etc. Adding electric shuttles to North Beachwood Drive will increase the dangers facing visitors and residents alike. Thank you. Tony Clark, followed by Laura Davis and David Benz. Good afternoon. I'm Tony Clark on Beachwood Drive. Um, our community was built in 1923 to 1924. Nothing has changed. The streets aren't any wider. It's still the small community 
neighborhood that it was meant to be. It is not commercial. It is not meant to have shuttles going up and down it. Shuttles to what? Everything has been closed. There is no reason to have a shuttle come up and down there. We cannot pass one another with our own neighbors. If somebody is parked on one side and the other side of the street, one car has to wait for the other one to back up or back down. They're also sending now that there is a thing says, and it's not legal, but uh, a legal, uh, was it loyal, uh, local only on Ledgewood, well, on Beach. So now they go up to the sh smallest streets and they turn up and then we can't walk there at all. The fire department, paramedics, no one will be able to get up and give us what we need to secure our neighborhood and our safety. Thank you. Uh, Laura Davis will be followed by David Benz, and the last speaker will be Jeff Swafford. Hi, um, council members. I'm Laura Davis. I'm a 30-year resident of Hollywood Land. I'm on the member. I mean, I'm on the board of the Hollywood Land Homeowners Association. The Dixon study, in my opinion, is deeply flawed um, for all of the reasons my neighbors have detailed. So I will share something else with you, which is last month. I got together with other members of our board and the boards of Lake Hollywood Estates, um, the Knowles, and the Oaks. And guess what? For all our differences, I wish Council Member Rue were listening. He isn't, but I see some of you are. Um, the one thing we discovered we have in common, despite some differences, is everybody in that room finds this study deeply flawed. We want tourists out of all of our neighborhoods. And there is a way to do that through, through the valley side. Um, we were also amused to learn that at various times, um, members of Council Member Roo's staff has referred to each one of our groups as the good group and the other groups as the troublemakers. Now that we're talking, that will come to an end. So thank you, and um, I'm sorry there was no competitive bidding for thank, this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David Benz, followed by Jeff Swafford. Hi, I'm David Benz. I'm Vice President of Lake Hollywood Homeowners Association. I've lived in the area uh, since 1984. Um, I have a couple of visuals for you. Um, first of all, of what we put up with. Um, this is tourist traffic on Mulholland Highway. Um, there's a sign right here that says no stopping anytime, but it's a very narrow road and we're constantly putting up with this. Um, illegal and dangerous. Um, this is some of the traffic congestion now that the Beachwood gates have been closed. Several blogs say that my neighborhood is the number one place to see the Hollywood sign. It's just a total mess over there. But and I also have some handouts for you guys, which I'll hand you. Okay. Um, most important, in thinking about it, I think the only good solution is a gondola built on the north side of the mountain, away from the residential neighborhoods. Um, the city definitely wants to encourage tourism, make it better than where they're coming up into Beechwood Canyon, into Lake Hollywood Estates. If you give them something better, you could monetize it, get a partner, a private operator. This is, I think, the best solution. Thank you. And the sergeant will bring their reports to us. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Jeff Swafford. Council members, thank you. I am a Hollywood uh, land uh, homeowner. I live on Linforth Drive off of Deronda. We've been in the neighborhood for just about six years, so much shorter time than many of our neighbors. But in that short time, I think we've seen a precipitous increase in vehicular traffic, uh, in pedestrian traffic, and significantly in traffic coming from the rideshare services that have very little regard for those of us that hike. For those of us that walk pets around blind corners in very limited circumstances, um, I'd encourage, you know, obviously workable solution that minimizes tourist traffic in the neighborhood. And in closing, I just wanted to ask my various neighbors that are opposed to the Dixon plan to stand up if they would. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our comments for item four. If we could have recreation and parks, uh, please. Join us and give us an overview of the report, please. Thank you. Good morning, uh, committee members, Council Member Rue, O'Farrell, and Price. Um, I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Joe Soliasis, the superintendent of Griffith Park. I'm A.P. Diaz, the executive officer at Recreation and Parks. And we have Roy Morales from the CLA's office. I think 
Roy would like to make a few opening remarks for his office, and then we're happy to follow through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Briefly, my name is Roy Morales. I'm with the CLA's office, and in January of 2018, as we all know, a consultant's report commissioned by Council District 4, known as the Dixon Study, was completed, and it offered 29 strategies to improve vehicle and pedestrian access, safety, and mobility in Griffith Park and around the Hollywood sign. And then on, in February 2018, this committee held a hearing on that study and on motion Rube Buscaino, which introduced that study to the council file. City Council subsequently endorsed um, the recommendation to have Rex and Parks, the CLA, and other relevant departments to look at the feasibility of the 29 studies and the 29 strategies in the Dixon study. And on today's agenda, as you, as you will see, is a joint report from Recreation and Parks in our office responding to those council instructions. This report provides a framework for discussion of the various strategies that are suggested. Most of the strategies in the Dixon study are feasible. The joint report reviews 23 of the 29 strategies and offers detailed recommendations that will help move forward those individual strategies that the city council determines are a priority. The CAO will help to identify fun potential funding sources to implement those strategies that are approved. And as noted in the report, the city departments have already begun implementing some of the suggested strategies, and six of the 29 strategies required further analysis, so they are not included. And we're available to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Council Member O'Farrell, and thank you, um, Mr. Morales, and Recreation and Parks would like to thank uh, the CLA's office uh, for their hard work in assembling uh, all of the various recommendations and conducting the Dixon study report into this document today. Uh, they've done an excellent job working with us and the other city departments that are affected. And we'd like to thank, of course, Council District 4 uh, for their leadership on this report. And as Mr. Morales pointed out, the whole purpose of the Dixon report is to look at ways uh, that we can make the park uh, and the neighborhoods in the city more safe and mobile and accessible. Uh, for residents and park users uh, in the city of LA. We believe that the Dixon study was a very comprehensive and good approach to sort of breaking out um, specific areas that we as a city could look at on focusing. And so we have had a chance, of course, to work with the CLA in reporting our assessment on the feasibility of some of these studies. And we believe that the report identifies uh, specific areas that we would categorize into um, feasible options, um, options that would need to be looked at for their practicality. Uh, some would need to look, be looked at for their viability. When I say that, I mean legally and environmentally. And then, of course, there's the fiscal is impact. All of those uh, variables uh, will help better guide and direct us as a department and how we work with our other city departments on accomplishing some of the tasks. Um, but we are most... Um, interested in looking at ways that we can sort of address some immediate concerns, and those would be certainly areas around expanded transit opportunities, uh, ways that we can improve traffic flows, ways that we can start reducing the environmental impact on the park, and when I say that I mean how can we look at alternative options, electric vehicles, um, what is the less amount of footprint in traffic and um, you know, environmentally hazardous materials that we can bring into the park, how can we reduce that and still accomplish some um, accessibility goals? So there's a variety of recommendations in this report. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's some things that we think are feasible, some things that we think would require more study, and some things that are going to be long-term. We're happy to answer questions on that and to clarify anything that was uh, pointed out in regards to our department. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and for obvious reasons, this is uh, very important to our colleague, uh, Mr. David Rue, so I'd like to turn this over to him at this point, uh, Mr. Rue. Thank you, Mr. Chair, very much appreciate that, and thank you all um, for bringing this up. And this report studies the feasibility of the various strategies proposed by the Dixon Resources Unlimited to resolve um, the issues of traffic, safety, and access around the Hollywood sign and Griffith Park. And I really want to thank uh, Recreation and Parks, as well as LA Department of Transportation, the Bureau of Engineering, the CLA's office, as well as all the other city departments who worked on this report to get this back. And I really look forward to our continued discussion on this. In March of 2017, I did commission a study 
by Dixon to look at ways of improving safety and public access to Griffith Park and the Hollywood sign. Dixon conducted multiple rounds of data collection and Dixon convened a working group with over 30 stakeholders and community members. Dixon released its report in January of 2018 outlining these 29 strategies. And in additionally, they briefed city officials and Dixon gave public presentations of its strategies. I encourage all my colleagues here, as well as on the city council, to review the public comment that has been uploaded online, in addition to having heard those here today. Now, work related to some of the strategies have already begun, been underway, including traffic calming measures, wayfinding, and additional enforcement. My office has already been using discretionary funds to pay for additional LAPD and Department of Transportation officers over the various holidays. And now, for fiscal year 2018-19, uh, budget includes almost a million dollars to the Department of Transportation's budget for additional enforcement officers for the Hollywood sign area. And I gotta say, this was my top ask to the mayor and to the city on behalf of Council District 4. Now, of the 29 Dixon strategies, I believe you found that 20 were feasible and a number of, and a number of others still need additional information. However, I am concerned by some of the language in the report, in particular strategy 2.1 a potential electric shuttle service to North Beachwood Drive. The mention of open air shuttles was particularly disturbing. As the author of the recently enacted legislation banning amplified sound and requiring headphones on tour buses, I know what, a negative, what the negative impact of open air commercial vehicles can have on communities. A city run or public transportation shuttle to restore some type of access to a popular entry point should be the goal. Now, regarding strategy 3.3, the aerial tram, or gondola, as someone uh, referred to earlier, I'm not yet convinced on the strategy. However, I do believe this is an idea that needs to be studied in a fact-based manner, including all required environmental analysis. However, again, I am very concerned by the language in this section. The, Dixon's, the Dixon report specifically proposed an aerial tram that would originate on the back or north side of Griffith Park, near freeway access and away from residential neighborhoods. The mention of the Greek Theater and the Griffith Observatory as location was particularly disturbing because both of these ideas were soundly rejected by the community last time. If this recommendation were to move forward, we should not be looking at the areas discussed, we should, we should be looking at the areas discussed in the Dixon study and not rehashing failed ideas of the past. So I'm very helpful to get some clarification from the departments. And Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, can I ask a couple of questions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In the report, um, this is to Recreation and Parks or anyone else could jump in. In the report, you ruled out two of the ideas. In particular, the alternate access trail plan to North Beachwood Drive and the second Hollywood sign. Why did you find these two ideas not feasible? With regards to the um, access points at Beachwood uh, Canyon, Mr. Council Member, we'd like to point out that the way that Recreation and Parks approaches this particular issue is, of course, with uh, some sensitivity to a certain amount of factors that are going on there. And it was mentioned during public comment. So we sort of see Beachwood Canyon as being, there's three issues at play. One is the idea of alternative paths, um, and that's actually constructing or connecting uh, pathways that will require us to do really sort of carve-outs into the mountainside and environmental issues. Um, there's also the idea of the accessibility that's going on there at the gate. And uh, of course, as the council members are aware, but the whole impetus to the litigation recently is regard to the existing business, um, Sunset Ranch. Uh, which is located there. So there's an ongoing business that has day-to-day -day operations um, that we are being mindful of in respect to the litigation and how the court ruling came out. And then there's, of course, just the feasibility and the impact to residents below who live in that area. So all of those three factors combined um, lead us to believe that an alternative pathway um, into the mountainside would be unfeasible. One, uh, it's going to be quite costly 
um, the environmental impact um, reports and assessments that would need to be done, as well as our own sort of assessments of that area. A lot of property issues abut in that area. There's a lot of private residential areas uh, that did not exist um, years ago uh, that are, would be problematic for us and how we would approach that. It's also a very steep um, and uh, liable this area that we would find some risk that we would not want to impact on our department. So it's one area that we, um, in discussing with the CLA, pointed out that from our perspective, it is not a viable or feasible option um, for doing that for the reasons that I stated. Thank you. And um, you mentioned it um, regarding 2.2, uh, the, uh, the alternate trail plan at Beechwood. Um, can you clarify a little bit further on the actual litigation you were talking about, continuing litigation, whether it's yourself or CLA? Sure. Um, from Recreation and Parks, um, and it, again, it was mentioned in public comment, um, and I will remind the council uh, members is that the specific ruling that recently was enacted um, in Sunset Ranch's favor and against the city of LA, when I say against the city of LA, the ruling specifically directed us not to interfere with the day-to-day -day business operations. So, right, but in specific, there's actually continuing litigation as well. Yes, so, so that litigation and those court orders are in place, um, and there is an ensuing litigation going on, um, continuing uh, encroachment issues uh, with Sunset Ranch uh, in that area and, uh, and other lawsuits related to that. So. There is continuous litigation that is going on, ensuing, and then there is litigation that uh, happened that we have to be respectful of those orders in what we do. Great, and AP, since you're doing so great, I got another question for you. Uh, <laughs> which of these recommended items are doable in a short time, time frame? And, um, and for those short-term um, implementations, what other departments do you need to be on board? So, council member, we think that when you look at the report, and there are so many recommendations, and Joe, who is our day-to-day -day superintendent, uh, can follow up or fill in if I, if I miss anything. But when we look at the report as a whole, and we think about what are some of the most viable and um, doable things that we could do in the short term to you know, improve the traffic safety. And again, this is, from our approach, this is for residents who live there as well as visitors. Um, and I know that this is a very difficult, so I speak to the people that are behind me because I know that you live there day to day and I've, I've seen it firsthand and I know that it is a nightmare situation to live in. Um, so to that extent, we believe that working with you uh, and the various other departments, we could really sort of enhance some pedestrian safety issues. So specifically in recommended strategies of 1.3, the post walkability signage, um, we'd like to continue to explore, and we are in the process already of how we would go along installing the sidewalk along Canyon Drive uh, to improve access up there and to make it easier if we are going to have people using that as an area um, to ac access the park. Um, we would like to continue to, to study the implementations of the electric shuttle vehicles um, and what does that mean in terms of modern day technology? How can we you know, lessen the environmental impact on the park if we were to look at bringing um, some uh, electric vehicles into the park? Um, and we would also like to look at how we could go about improving some of our um, just general wayfinding signs and making it easier and working with other uh, entities to take people away from the the park and Joe if you would just comment on some things that we're currently doing but where the council member was asking that we could use some more assistance thank you AP. so uh, our our goals with the department are to continue on to look at different ways of wayfinding throughout the park to make it easier and more logical for people to approach different sites different areas around the park also uh, mobility movement with wayfinding with motorists who are entering the park and making it much easier for uh, auto traffic to traverse the park. Although we want to encourage uh, most people to use multimodal ways, including public transportation. That's a big, um, that's a big jump forward that we're trying to move in with the Department of Rec and Parks with DOT. Also, I do want to say that many of these projects that we are working on that are rather you know, some people may think that it's very easy to reach these conclusions and get those jobs done.
but we really need a lot of support from our sister and brother departments, Bureau of Street Services, Bureau of Engineering, LADOT, to help us do these projects uh, that Mr. Diaz had mentioned a few minutes ago, which include installing perhaps a sidewalk or a, uh, a uh, permeable surface sidewalk along Canyon Drive, uh, things of that nature, but we really need a lot of support. It, it's not, there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, jurisdictional lines that are crossed with uh, public works, for instance, that we need to work out. So Joe, aren't we currently working on a project that we've, we've had a, an issue with a permit um, that we could use some help getting resolved? Yeah, that's the, uh, obs that's uh, 4.1 on your list here. Talks about obscure views of the Hollywood sign from the smaller vista points along Mulholland Highway. We've been trying desperately to put in uh, maybe guard railing or some sort of rail to separate cars from pedestrians. And that's been a challenge for us trying to get through the uh, process of getting permitting. So in this case, that's a good example of working alongside with public works to get this type of project done. Thank you for that. And, and we also have been working closely with you on that particular uh, issue. And we would like to move that forward. And, um, and I think this is something that has been something that we've discussed for a long, long time. Um, but yes, uh, we'll be continuing to work with that so we can implement that as soon as possible. Um, but, and I am so, not just that, but there's so many others that you just pointed out that I'm really looking forward to as well. But I'm going to ask you the big question. How about funding? Have you identified potential funding sources for those as well as the other strategies? We are, we are continuously looking to find funding. Obviously, we're going to go to the CAO to hope that they would be able to support some of these measures. Others would come through possibly Quimby funds, possibly uh, uh, maybe there's a special funding that may be available through the department, through Rec and Parks, through LADOT, others that could help support us. But at this point, uh, we're still looking for the funding. Um, do you do any of these items need to go to the RAP Commission, uh, the Recreation and Parks Commission, for approval? And if it does, what does that process look like? Um, some of these proposals would need to go to our board, um, Recreation and Parks Commission. Um, oh, and earlier, thank you so much for um, passing along the uh, consent item for our president, uh, Sylvia Patsoris. We all adore her in the Department of Recreation and Parks, so thank you for addressing that earlier. Um, the process would be, obviously, we would want to continue working with your office, Councilmember Rue, um, before we get to our board to appropriately discuss things with the community, um, to have a good community dialogue, um, and we would be uh, responsive to you on helping us to lead that, and then we would go to our board afterwards to ask them to approve things. Um, obviously, if it required funding, um, they would have the oversay of that as well, um, but they certainly, on matters uh, dealing with this study, they would certainly also take some direction from the council, I think, in, in seeing what your preference is for certain approaches. So we would be happy to work in helping to bridge those when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And you know, on the Griffith Park side, uh, we now have the phase one seven day a week shuttle service to the, from the Metro Red Line um, to the observatory. How are the efforts going in instituting a park-wide circulator shuttle? So, Councilman, we're looking at, hopefully by the end of this year, to start working with different uh, bus companies. Uh, one that's very exciting, our, you know, we're trying to stick to an uh, environmentally friendly bus that would traverse its way through the park, do a route that would include all the way on the north side to Travel Town, and all the way up on the uh, southern end to the observatory, and every stop in between. The idea here is to open it up to the public where you can park your car, say at Travel Town and hop on the hop on, hop off style bus that will take you to these different amenities throughout the park. And we're very excited about moving forward with this. Uh, we're looking now at how LADOT can assist us with uh, putting together a pilot program where we would use buses that are already in service uh, to move people around the park, wrap the buses with uh, logos that um, advertise and support Griffith Park and uh, be able to uh, move public, uh, multimodal way. You could bring a bicycle, you could hike into the park, you could take public transportation, which we completely encourage to use the red line, for instance, to the dash bus, and then you could connect with the park-wide uh, shuttle bus that will take you throughout Griffith Park for a wonderful experience and day in the park. 
I'm very excited about that. And since we have the zoo people here, it's not just north-south, it's from the zoo all the way to Ferndale as well, right? That's right. So I'm um, very excited about that. Now for the CLA, um, there were six items not included in this report. In particular, 4.2, 5.1, 5.2, 6.1, 6.2, and 6.4. I'm not going to read them out out loud to save time. But what is your timetable to complete the report for these items? On, on some of these, many of these, we'll be working with the LA DOT. Some, for example, might involve looking at state law, which we were, unfam we were not familiar with when we initially began the study. So it could, it could be done within the upcoming recess and hopefully return the report to you soon thereafter. Great. And, and Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, just to close, you know, um, I did want to ask you to hold this report in committee for the time being as we wait all of these updates. However, I would at love to ask you if you could reschedule this item in committee as soon as we get back from council recess so we can move on a number of these items, in particular the few short-term items that we should be able to implement fairly quickly. But as we've heard, a uh, majority of these recommendations involve more study and community engagement, um, which is why I'd like to continue in the committee. But again, I really want to thank all the departments, the city family, and I really want to thank all the community members who came out today to testify. Uh, you know, they're all, actually every single one of you are familiar faces. I think I met with you all individually or in groups. Um, and you know, this is a challenging issue and ha with very passionate voices. Um, and, but I am very encouraged that there are many promising ideas in the report as actually some of the speakers even agreed to, to improve a access and public safety to the crown jewel of our system, which is Griffith Park. So I really thank all the community members for being engaged and coming out today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rue. And Joe, you mentioned the, the uh, circulator, the, the, the shuttle, the hop on, hop off, and you mentioned environmentally friendly as far as a, a way, do you mean just because it would get more people out of their cars, or are you talking about uh, an electric ultimately, shuttle? Ultimately, we would want to use an electric shuttle mm -hmm. to uh, provide that service. Okay. But getting there is a little difficult at this yeah. point because of the lack of inventory, to be quite honest, with the electric buses. So little by little, that's our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Rue, uh, what I'd like to do is it, definitely continue the item, hold it in committee, and... Uh, I think this, since the report is fairly hot off the press just from late last week, then this gives everyone some time to digest it and debate it and hash out the details and argue back and forth on what makes sense and what doesn't, to identify funding sources or possible funding sources, et cetera. And a particular entrance in the 13th district, of course, is um, items 2.1 in relation to the metro station, uh, 7.2 in relation to the visitor center, uh, 7.4 in, in relation to a suggestion uh, for various Hollywood sign installations um, along the boulevard. Uh, so, yes, reporting back would be terrific uh, and also in, involve the groups, um, the, the local groups that uh, are affected, including the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, for example, the Business Improvement District, uh, because they're going to have lots of uh, suggestions based on ideas that have come and gone and best practices from the, in other words, there's going to be a wealth of knowledge from the folks, many of whom spoke today, uh, who, who are going to be most directly affected, and then uh, those in the business community as well. So yes, Mr. Rue, what we'll do is we'll hold it in committee and report back um, in 60 days. And Mr. Chair, again, I, I just go, again want to use this time to thank you to you and your office for being so collaborative, because yes, many of these strategies are, are um, affects your district as well and, and the fact that we're a city and, and, and if we're neighboring districts where we work on so many different issues together including this one um, I really appreciate your, you and your staff's um, collaboration in this matter. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure and of course boundary lines are of town amount of importance to us but to the everyday person they do not care at all understandably <laughs> so we have to always keep that in mind and I neglected to ask Mr. Price if he would like to weigh in or have any no, comments on that. I'm glad we're moving forward on this. Obviously, the, there's some passionate feelings on both sides. I know the uh, council office has worked hard trying to build some consensus uh, and to uh, hear the concerns, the legitimate concerns raised by all parties. So I'm happy to support the, uh, the action as proposed. Thank you, Mr. Price, and thank you, Mr. Rue. Terrific. And uh, that brings us then. Thank, thank you, gentlemen, for, thank you. for this.
Uh, and that then brings us to, uh, we'll now go back to the order and, and go to item uh, two. And I think we need to give Mr. Morales a moment, or you can read from there. Read from here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Item number two, Los Angeles Zoo Department report relative to the supplemental agreement item of understanding between the Zoo Department and the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association for marketing, public relations, site rentals, and catered events for fiscal year 2017-18. Thank you so much. And there are no additional speakers for item two. Uh, so we will have Mr. John Lewis uh, come up for the overview. Hello, welcome. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Council Members. John Lewis, uh, General Manager from the Los Angeles Zoo and Botanical Gardens. Uh, yes, we have uh, submitted our, the business and marketing plan uh, for this past fiscal year uh, and finished it about mid-year, and you have that before you right now, uh, asking that you support this plan so that we can move forward on the uh, uh, memos of understanding that are appropriate with uh, Glaza, our partners at the zoo. Along with the business and marketing plan, we've also uh, submitted the MOU for the marketing uh, efforts at the zoo so that we can uh, follow through with the appropriate reimbursements to Glaza for the marketing and public relations activities they've done for the zoo. So we would ask that the committee approve these items so we can move them forward. All right. Ms. Barrett, welcome. Do you have anything to add? No. no? Just no? Any All right. Questions. So we can jump right into the questions. and. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll commence with that. Um, talking about uh, attendance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the marketing goals, uh, uh, does the department, do you have a way of keeping demographic info in terms of attendance changes? Um, uh, I know there was a drop in attendance and perhaps that can be attributed uh, if, there, if there's a, a data-based way to, to hone in on what that can be attributed to, mm -hmm. perhaps a specific demographics. But I mean, so the marketing director is here, but yes, we have demographic information on all of our attendants from paid to unpaid, whether it's adults, uh, paying school groups, you know, children, senior citizens. So we can see every month um, where our visitors are coming from and then we can look at trends okay. when there are changes. So when we see that attendance is down, we definitely have the data that tells us what it's attributed to. Any, any sense of where that is year over year? I, I know that I think the demographic information or the not demographic information, but the, the attendance information is on page 22 of the, of the report. Yes. So Overall, um, attendance has grown and largely attributed to the nighttime ticketed events, while daytime attendance has pretty much remained um, flat. Um, in the last few years, paid attendance has um, gone up, but one of the most significant changes in attendance overall has been a decline in our member attendance. So nighttime has been going up, um, daytime has kind of been remaining flat, and membership um, as a portion of that has been going down. And, they think that it's, it's sort of price resistance, so um, they're trying to develop a strategy on how to um, stem the tide on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perhaps members are attending night events more than they're just going to the zoo during the daytime? <laughs> Is that a possibility? That I'm not sure of. Okay. It's just off the top of my head. It's okay. It's all right. Um, One of the other factors, though, that we're seeing is that uh, a lot of the individuals that were buying memberships we're doing it particularly on days when we had long lines of people waiting to get into the zoo. And we really have extended and expanded our mobile ticketing opportunities. And we're seeing a surge in those opportunities. So while attendance has gone down a little bit, our revenues have actually gone up. And we think that maybe people are moving from the membership line and actually buying their ticket online, uh, a regular admission ticket online, and then coming directly into the zoo. Uh, here's a question. Has, has zoo attendance for the 2017, 2018 met or exceeded the targeted goals in this plan. It, can that be identified within this 2.7% increase? So we haven't quite finished the fiscal year, but we think we're gonna be right on target to achieve the attendance uh, goals that are in the plan, yes. Okay. Um, and can you elaborate a little more on the marketing plan in terms of the elements that are uh, uh, currently in the business and marketing plan that address um, low-income families? 
that I'm definitely going to have to defer to the marketing director on. Good afternoon, hello and welcome. Thank you. Um, I think as far as low income families, what we try to do is provide discount opportunities within, for instance, um, multicultural markets, and um, actually grocery stores, um, and other discounted opportunities throughout the year during times where we need a lift in um, attendance. Mm -hmm. So we try to meet the need, um, well not, creating a constant discount situation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that sounds good. So I, I, the idea of discounts, are you by any chance reaching out to t public schools within a certain radius of the zoo itself? Because I find um, over and over again, people who have visited the zoo love it. They think it's amazing because it is. Yeah. But so many kids, even at the the, the local grade school near me, Fletcher Drive Elementary, the vast majority of those families have never been to the zoo. That's, that's anecdotal, it's not mm -hmm. a fact, but it just, right. so many kids and their families who live sometimes in neighborhoods uh, of financial struggle um, still aren't coming to the zoo. So, so I, that's a long way of saying, perhaps target some of the schools, uh, LAUSD public schools. Right, so um, just, I, mean, I know we do the buses, we do, you know, we, we, we have school kids that come, but as far as just the day in, you know, targeting children that will encourage right. their family, to bring their families uh, with at a discounted rate. Yeah, and sorry, I did introduce myself. I'm Kate Hilliard, oh. Vice President of Marketing at the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association. Um, yeah, so we've recently implemented a kind of a bounce back program for those kids that do come. Um, on field trips, they get a discount coupon for a free child return visit to try to get the families engaged uh, in the zoo as well as when they come as part of their school visit. Um, and I think that there's outreach to the schools through the education department, but nothing where we specifically, you know, have a, a program to discount to get those families in. But I think that's an interesting idea that we could look at. Yeah, and sports teams, uh, after school programs. Uh, yeah. I know that we participate every year and we'll, we'll select a school and we'll give a, get a bus and we'll have a whole class of, is it fifth graders? Yes, it is. Come, come out. Um, uh, it seems to me that there's an opportunity, especially just, like I said, within a certain radius, uh, where families already live near the zoo, but they feel perhaps it's still to some families an abstract right. experience. Right. Uh, if we could bridge that gap, that would be a, a terrific thing. So thank you for that. Um, so the zoo is committed to sub, uh, submitting a multi-year plan, um, a, a multi-year marketing uh, plan. Where are we with that? So at this point, you know, getting through all this, we're going to start working on the next plan. And uh, if you'll, if you'll uh, give me a couple minutes, I would really like to suggest at this point that this next year we focus on some of the recommendations that have come out of the controller's audit, as well as things that we've been talking about at the zoo, and really focus on trying to bring all of the agreements that affect the operation of the zoo and the partnership with Glaza uh, under a, a more streamlined, more transparent document, uh, and spend this next year doing that. In the meantime, if the council would approve it, if we bring the MOUs necessary to keep work going through the year, for the council to this committee and council to approve, then we can work on those other agreements. And hopefully in the future, all this will be a lot easier, a lot clearer, and definitely easier for the zoo and Glaza to keep up on in a timely manner. Okay. And <clears throat> this is this was really just uh, sort of news to me more recently, but is there talk of perhaps having a library presence, <laughs> a, a city library presence? There, there's talk about the, the zoo's zoo? library. We have we have a, a library uh, that is in disrepair, and we're trying to do several things: move it into a larger room that will be more functional for the staff and uh, potentially available for research to the public. 
um, we're not at the point at the zoo at least that um, we want people coming in and taking our books out. We have a lot of uh, fairly technical and valuable books that we'd rather not leave the site. Uh, but literally there's been like one and a half meetings on that topic so far. I was reluctant to even say anything, but it's anytime it involves libraries and research and studying and bringing more people who want to learn, yeah. it seems like it's always a good direction to go in especially with relation to animals and habitat preservation, uh, et cetera. I, try, I, I totally Species. agree. I spent many days in places all over the world in the downtown New Orleans library. Well, there you go. Um, all right, um, colleagues, questions? Mr. Uh, Mr. Price. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the report and for the questions that, that uh, in fact, you posed, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I remember last year we had this kind of discussion about outreach, about how we can bring more people to the, to the, uh, to the zoo. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we, we had some uh, discussion about, uh, I guess, some discount programs. Uh, I'm just kind of disappointed that we can't quantify it anymore. This year we did X, Y, Z, or we had X number of groups there. Uh, certainly, um, I think you're missing an opportunity if you're not uh, plugging in with some of the community-based organizations nonprofit organizations. I mean, you don't necessarily have to do all the marketing yourself, but if you can identify some key organizations in a number of communities, it just seems to me that would be an, another way to, uh, you know, help drive traffic uh, and build on the, the, um, the fact that lots of kids, as Councilman pointed out, that lots of kids, and, and not just the ones who live near there haven't been to the zoo, certainly those across town haven't been to the zoo, in the areas I represent, for example. So I'm anxious to work with you, but I'm just heart disheartened that, we, that it's not, it doesn't appear to be a more aggressive, a more intentional, a more um, uh, important uh, kind of, of uh, objective to have in terms of increasing the diversity and increasing the, especially with kids and their families. You know, that, that's, right. you know, that's how we kind of build the bench. Well, comments it is that. important to us, Council Member. I want to assure you that. And uh, if you want, we can send you a report back that better quantifies what we are doing. Because in addition to the things that you heard this last year, we actually reached out to several of the agencies that are supporting the homeless families and brought those families to the zoo uh, free of charge. Uh, so we are interested in doing those things, and we have numbers, and we can provide those. They may still not be as ambitious as we want, but at least give you a better idea. Well, it's a benchmark, and we yes, can build from that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. I think it's a great point. I certainly didn't mean to only focus on a certain radius near the zoo. I, I was kind of thinking in terms of low-hanging fruit. But, but you're right. Perhaps when you have your strategy thinking sessions about marketing, you could think of in terms of uh, radius segments, right? But we certainly want kids from the North Valley and South LA and Boyle Heights and er everywhere else, San Pedro even, um, uh, in communities um, to feel that the zoo is theirs and that they can access it. So yeah, it's, yeah, uh, and again, it's a challenge. And, you, know, you mentioned the fact that you're passing out the, the uh, passes in the markets. And I mean, again, that sounds like a good idea, but uh, you know, I don't know, just randomly passing them out or you know, what times of day. I mean, I just think you, you can target it a little bit better. Uh, and get a little bigger bang and, and more accountability as opposed to just passing out discount coupons in the market, right? Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's also more than just offering discount tickets. It's, it's, an, it's, if we can think of an additional gesture to make people feel that they're welcome at the zoo, like here are the instructions that there, there's a concierge sort of element to this. Like when you and your family arrive, you can park at this area, come to this gate, you'll be given a map of the zoo, and it, it seems that there's an opportunity, I think. And, uh, and I didn't mention this yet, but the whole, the whole multiple languages issue, right? I know that a couple of years ago, I was very heartened to, I was listening to Spanish radio, and I, I heard an ad in Spanish for the LA Zoo, and it was fantastic. It was great. So uh, I, I haven't uh, heard one recently, but uh, that doesn't mean you're not still airing those, but things to consider. Thank you for that. So uh, as far as uh, Mr. Rubini, no, uh, recommended action, approve the LA Zoo 2017-2018 business and marketing plan and supplemental agreement to the business and marketing plan. Uh, instruct the zoo department to submit to the city council a five-year business and marketing plan that reflects an updated relationship with Glaza. 
uh, that emphasizes maximum revenue to the department and implements measurable benchmarks for Glaza's expenditure of its share of zoo revenue. Uh, item number three, instruct the zoo department to include in the five-year business and marketing plan specific strategies for outreach, uh, engagement, and increasing participation of low-income families throughout the city, including identifying language barriers. Uh, and four, request the zoo department to submit a supplemental report detailing historical demographic trends in attendance broken down by the targeted groups specified in the business and marketing plan. And I think a year-to-year -year comparison that might be able to uh, convey to us the trends, uh, which could help identify you know, areas of focus for marketing. Uh, and without objection, those will be the instructions. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Morales, that brings us to item three. Item three, Mr. Chairman, the Chief Legislative of Analysts and City Administrative Officer Joint Report relative to the health and well-being of Billy the Elephant. Thank you, and I know we have the CLA uh, and CAO. Is CAO here? Oh, yeah, there we go. Mr. Morales and Ms. Sawyer. Oh, and we do have some uh, comments as well. We have a few public comments here. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, my apologies. You're welcome to sit there, but we're going to have comments. Uh, we have Silvio Curtis, followed by Kirsten Cluster, followed by Patty Schenker. So um, I would just like to say that uh, from what I've heard about the criteria proposed for the uh, committee that's to evaluate whether to uh, let Billy out of the zoo, uh, I think it's inappropriate that they are treating this as simply a question of uh, whether the environment for Billy is up to zoo standards. It is also a question of whether the standard zoo environment is appropriate for elephants. And uh, we do not think that um, it is appropriate uh, for uh, zoo, uh, for, the, um, for the members of this committee to be limited for that reason uh, to zoo accredited um, individuals. Uh, that's essentially saying that um, only zoo approved people can evaluate whether zoo standards are appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten Cluster, followed by Patty Schenker. Good afternoon. There is a critical need for an unbiased independent panel of professionals to assess Billy's well-being in his current situation. I strongly urge this committee to amend recommendation one to ensure that the widest range of veterinarians with wild and exotic animal experience are considered for this panel. As it is written, recommendation one violates the instructions of this committee given last January to appoint a panel of members who are independent from the zoo industry. In fact, this recommendation guarantees the panel will be, will be made up of zoo affiliates, which would bias this process and produce a report that lacks integrity. I respectfully request this committee to revise the recommendation to eliminate the requirement of full-time zoo experience and allow for a wider range of accreditation. I also request that the CLA be instructed to consult experts and advocates not affiliated with zoos during the panel selection process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patty Schenker, followed by Marlene Goodman. Yes, good afternoon, city good. council members. I thought we were going to hear who the three veterinarians were picked today, but I do want to say that they should be independent. If you have to, get a zoo veterinarian, get a sanctuary veterinarian, and get one impartial veterinarian. I'm sure you can find it. And I hope we can do this soon. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Marlene Goodman, uh, followed by David Castleman. I just wanted to bring out that it's really hard to make commentary for two reasons. Number two, most of the time nobody in the front is listening to what everyone is saying, and I find that very offensive. And number two, we haven't been given the information where we can educationally respond in good faith when we don't even know what's going on. Like, are members of the sanctuaries being given a fair shot at being part of this independent veterinary group. We don't know if they are or if they're not. So how can we speak to you in total ignorance when most of the public do not know what's going on? And when we do speak, you're not even listening. Thank you. David Castleman, followed by Ann Bradley. Good afternoon. Thanks for considering the issue further. If the goal is objective assessment of the care condition, the habitat of the zoo, with respect to Billy, you need only look to the trial court findings in a case where experts from all over the world examined this question and the judge made very specific factual findings. But if you feel you need to go further, at least start by looking at the findings of the judge who said their zoo is injuring the elephants, it has insufficient training and care, questioned the actual credibility of the recommendations from the zoo to this council. But if you're going to find people, don't find people who are steeped in zoo cult-like practices. Their goal is how to maintain elephants in zoos, not how to provide best practices, cares, care for elephants in general. And that's really what the question is. If the goal is just how to keep them in a zoo, they're doing it already. Thank you. And Bradley followed by Judith Powell. constituent of the 13th district, I come here to totally support Ms. Cluster's recommendation. You are asking why attendance is down. Attendance is down is because our entire world community is waking up about animals. The fact is these majestic creatures typically walk 1,000 miles a year. They need to be in the wild or in a much safer condition than they are over in Griffith Park. There are so many ways that we can interact with animals do not need to create these situations where we jeopardize their health, their happiness. We are old enough and we have seen change and we need to change the way we are treating these animals. These elephants do not belong in the zoo. Thank you, Ann. Judith Powell, our last speaker. I was at the January Council um, meeting when it was determined that there would be appointed an independent panel of vets so that the vets don't just come from the zoo or the zoo industry. I am kind, I'm kind of stunned by the fact that it's my information and perhaps it's co incorrect that these vets are only going to be from the zoo industry, zoo vets, even if it's not the LA Zoo. That is not independent. That's bias and that's prejudiced. And I thought that we were going to look at it. We can get wildlife vets that are specialists in Asian elephants. There are many of them. We can get sanctuary vets who can show the difference. They'll be able to demonstrate the difference in his health and his, ex and his existence and his environment. You can't do that with only zoo vets. I can't believe that the panel is only going to appoint vets from other zoos. That completely destroys the process of any kind of unbiased evaluation, and I'm, pr I'm hoping you won't do it that way. So thank you. All we have before us are recommendations from uh, the CLA in a report. No decisions have been made. In fact, we're going to be pouring over these recommendations and having a discussion after hearing public testimony about it. So don't think that something is already baked and we're already identifying who's going to do the evaluations because we haven't made that choice at all. So I just want, for the record, make that really clear. Um, all right, we have um, our colleague, Mr. Kuretz. Mr. Paul Kuretz is here. Uh, we'd like to read into the record a letter. Welcome to the chambers, Mr. Kuretz. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to offer comments on the report from the CLA and the CAO in response to your committee's instructions on January 24th regarding Billy. I understand that the proposed selection methodology is based on a concern regarding the Brown Act. I'm curious if anyone consulted with the city attorney as to whether there would be a way to structure the selection of veterinarians so that the committee and council could play a role in the decision beyond approving the recommendations in this report. With regard to recommendation one, it's clear to me that it defies the committee's stated instruction that the study of Billy's health and well-being be conducted by an independent panel of non-zoo affiliated veterinarians. As written, it would ensure that any veterinarian's assessment would substantially be dominated by professionals whose livelihoods directly depend or have depended upon zoos, and additionally, whose ability to conduct the assessment of Billy likely would be heavily impacted by the zoo department's influence. That does not reflect independence. Allowing and seriously considering veterinarians with a wider range of expertise with exotic and wild animals opens the way to create a panel that I believe does meet the, the committee's intent. In fact, the committee should insist that such veterinarians be chosen to ensure the integrity of this process. I've submitted a letter which offers substitute language for recommendation one, and I refer you to it. It works to provide the city with a broader and more representative range of veterinarians to choose from and eliminates restrictive criteria that basically guarantee that the panel membership does not meet this, the committee's requested criteria. The report's background discussion also refers to including some suggestions from Council District 5. I want to clarify the only conversations my office had with the CLA's staff regarding the substance of this matter happened at a time when I expected the committee to actually choose the panel membership. And so the suggestions concerning three veterinarians I thought should be considered um, and hopefully uh, still will be considered uh, were made by my office. My office has had no further input into this report. I strongly believe that the assessment of Billy's health and welfare must be conducted by professionals who are as independent as possible of obligations to and the doctrines and influence of the zoo industry. I'm prepared to accept the results of a fairly conducted assessment, but recommendation one as currently written clearly will not result in objectivity and fairness and does not appear to be designed to do so. I ask you to amend the recommendations to ensure independence in the widest possible range of input. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Uh, I have a question. I think uh, Mr. Rue and I both have questions, perhaps Mr. Price as well. So Mr. Rue, I'd like to defer to you first, uh, and then I really only have one, uh, one main question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, before I begin, I really want to um, I failed to uh, thank my staff um, for working overtime um, in addition to your staff as well as CLA and all the city family regarding this issue for Billy as well as the previous issue for Dixon, um, who's worked long nights. So I really want to thank my staff for all their work. Um, but for this issue, I really want to thank the CLA's office for compiling the list of experts to study Billy's health and address the council's questions and concerns. Since this discussion began, I have said that our decision on Billy should be impartial and independent and made by one standard and one standard only, the facts. These facts can only come from trained professional experts in the field of Asian elephants. And as council members, it is important to admit when we don't know something. And none of us, none of the council members are experts when it comes to Billy. Likewise, council offices have no place in nominating those experts who will be studying Billy's health. We are elected political offices, and, we, and it only serves to muddy the waters and cheapen the process if we get to handpick our experts or our facts. Now, I also want to be clear to take this time to, be, to clearly state that this in no reflection, this what we're talking about today is in no reflection of the zoo staff or their quality of work.
but rather this is a reflection of how important it is to have a fully independent review. In light of all the emotions and opi opinions swirling around this debate, this analysis must be free from even the perception of bias so that we can have this question resolved once and for all. I am not interested in ideology or opinion from either side of this debate. I am interested in the impartial, independent analysis of Billy's health and well-being. Nothing more than that. And what is best for his future. I believe the only way we could have a fair and uninfluenced analysis I believe that only with a fair and uninfluenced analysis can we make a decision that is worthy of Angelinos that we represent and worthy of Billy. Now, um, can I ask some questions? Of course, or absolutely. Like to? Yeah. Oh. So, uh, could I get the departments to come on up? Uh, CLACO. Thank you very much. Seeing you guys again. Um, in your report, it doesn't specify how many veterinarians will make up this panel. I just want to confirm um, in, the in our initial report, we asked for three. So I want to confirm that's going to be three. Or if it's going to be increased, I want to make sure it's an odd number. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Councilman Rue. Yes, um, as instructed by the committee, we will be recommending or selecting three veter medical veterinarians. In addition, however, as we mentioned in the report, some of the questions that, are, that were posed by the committee are more appropriate for answering by a subject matter expert who is not a medical expert, but in fact an expert in the subject matter whose input would then be given to the medical experts for incorporation into the report. Thank you for that, and actually I'm going to get to that, but before, I just want to confirm one more thing. Very obvious, but I just want to make sure. I want to confirm that these panelists will conduct their own independent studies regarding Billy's, Billy's health, and they won't be working together um, uh, for one finding. Mr. Uh, Councilman Rue, we're going to try and incorporate, try and uh, coordinate their visits to the zoo to maximize the amount of time they can spend there reviewing ex uh, recommendations or reviewing medical records. However, um, we would like their independent input into the whole report. And I understand um, the need for uh, their uh, scheduling and coordinating visits, but at the same time, if we could try to make it as impartial and separate as possible. I don't want to tell, I don't want to instruct the zoo or wrap, I mean, instruct the zoo or CLA and exactly what the timetable or what time they should actually have meetings, but I think it's very important knowing the heightened sensitivity of this issue that we try to make sure we are at even perception of impartiality in every which way um, is, is needed. Um, so. Your report also states that you're planning to consult and, and, and going to your, um, thank you for bringing it up, about subject matter experts to aid the medical professionals in answering the questions submitted by the committee. I'm assuming that you will need separate experts on rototilling, zoo accreditation, and, and matters similar to those. Uh, I'd like to know exactly what these subject matters, who, the, who they are, and what they'll be studying. Um, who they are, Mr. Uh, sorry, Councilman Rue. Uh, would be, as you mentioned, individuals who would be familiar, with, for example, with rototilling standards. An, an elephant um, um, uh, manager, for example, el or an elephant curator, who is not a medical veterinarian, but in fact takes care of elephants at um, accredited zoos. Um, that is the type of individual. Th th those are a couple of examples of individuals. So, so how many experts are we talking about? That could be fluid. We, do, we are committing to three medical uh, veterinarians. Mm -hmm. and. Once that panel is um, uh, convened, then we will determine what assistance they need from the subject matter experts. We don't envision that many. It's just simply a matter of getting answers to every single one of the committee's questions. Do you know what subjects, um, have you, do you have a list of subjects that, uh, of subject matter experts you need? I mean like the actual subjects, not the number of experts, but. We have a list of these, of potential ex subject matter experts, but the, the actual questions are attached to the committee report, so we will have to allow 
the panel to do their medical, to do their independent evaluation and then determine which of those questions they cannot answer for which they will need assistance from a subject matter expert. And or it's, it, it's very possible that as, as the, this progresses that as, if we find a need for additional, um, uh, additional experts, we could, we could go and do that. Uh, so I think this is going to be an evolving process as well. And, and I think that's going to be a very sensitive matter, and I know the, the chair um, rightfully so wants to continue this because I think that's something that we need answered, exactly what subject field are you guys looking at, um, exactly how many experts you're planning to consult, um, uh, you know, what qualifications do they possess to be considered a, a subject matter expert? Because as you know, for this issue, every piece of this is going to be uh, analyzed with a fine-tooth comb, and also, these subject matter experts, we need to have a need for impartiality. Um, so, but um, could, you, uh, could you walk us through the process for the study? About for the three uh, um, veterinarians, medical expert veterinarians. I'm assuming that the medical professionals would conduct their health examinations, provide their medical findings. Then I'm assuming that the CLA will identify and work with the subject matter experts or uh, to answer some of the other questions that we presented before, or is it in conjunction? I mean, you kind of alluded to it, but if, if we walk, walk us through that process. Um, as uh, Ms. Calpine mentioned, it, is, it has to be a fluid process. We will initially convene the three medical experts to allow them full access to, through the zoo department, to, to medical records, to uh, Billy, to his environment, to see which of the questions that they can answer. Um, during that process, we will identify um, what questions need additional assistance, whether from a subject matter, from any of the subject matter experts that are on this list or others that we may identify who can supplement their information, following which that report would then be um, forwarded to uh, our office and the CAO's office for uh, we will um, review that, that assessment, provide a cover memo to this committee and also work with the zoo department because there are certain questions that you'll notice on the list that only the LA Zoo can answer. Um, and those, those will need to have responses as well. And you know, um, I don't know, if, I believe the zoo already answered in, uh, the questions uh, to the best of their ability. Um, and I don't think that their answers were transmitted. Um, can we include that in the uh, next report from the January committee, all the questions? from the zoo? I mean, the answer is from the zoo to the questions? Well, we can Mr. bring the zoo. Talk about from the previous committee yes. hearing? Yes. So all the questions that you're listing in the report. So, uh, well, actually, sorry about that. It, it should be an instruction. I, be, I believe, okay. yes, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So I would like to instruct, and I have other, so one of the recommendations is if we could get the zoo to answer all the questions to be included in the report, the next report that comes. And, um, and I do, did have other recommendations, but you know, uh, after speaking uh, with, with our chair, um, I support the desire to continue this item, especially in light of new information. And it looks like from what we're talking about, again, I don't want any, I'm not making, we're not making any decisions here, but it looks like there'll be two separate experts, the three medical veterinarians, as well as other subject matter experts. And that process probably needs to be flushed out more and more clear exactly how it's gonna work and how the two are gonna be working uh, collaborating with each other. And, you know, and there's also sort of new information, including the letter from our colleague, Councilmember Koretz, which, uh, as well as other concerns, which was literally brought us to us today. So I don't, I, I concur with your decision, Mr. Chairman, that we should continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rue. And, and uh, thank you for this report. I, I have some, I have two questions now. Um, in relation to subject, the subject matter, the subject at hand, and um, also, in relation to the three, um, those three that are chosen for doing the evaluation, is one of the criteria understanding Asian elephant behavior in the wild? Is, is, is part of the subject matter understanding the physical and psychological needs of Asian elephants in the wild? I mean, I know we're going to get to the medical piece, and, and, I, and, I, and I ask that without bias, right? And that's just it. Everyone's going to, we're human. We bring in our own opinions to things. Um, and and that's, that's fine. But in, in the case of Billy and someone who's followed that arc since 2002, like I have, 
uh, it's, it's much larger than just his physical well-being. And there are debates back and forth on the state of his physical well-being, and I get all that. Uh, but is that going to be one of the elements in, in the subject matter? Councilmember Terry Sauer from the CAO's office. Part of the criteria in the selection criteria is a knowledge of Asian elephants, and one would assume that that cannot be, um, that that experience has to encompass both being in the wild and observing the elephants in the wild and also having some experience with those in captivity. So we would not view um, a knowledge as exclusive to either wild or captive. It, it would seem to me they would have to have both. And there's no doubt that veterinarians who um, are in charge of the care and well-being of animals in a zoo, um, there's no doubt that they're going to have some sort of understanding of their physical uh, needs. Um, and without bias, right? Veterinarians in general care about the livelihood of their patients, which happen to be animals. Uh, just wanted to make sure that's an element and perhaps that value should be stated in the criteria for selection. I understand, and that could actually, we, we will take another look at the criteria and uh, ensure that that is included. So that, uh, thank you. And then a question in terms of our colleague, Mr. Kretz's letter, um, he, he, mentions, he mentions the American College of Animal Welfare, the U.S. Department of Agricultural Animal Plant Health Inspection Service National Veterinary Accreditation Program. I think that's one other group, right? So he mentions the, the, two, the two groups. Um, does the CLA or CO have any information on these groups or, or organizations? No, I mean, we, we saw this letter uh, as we came in as well, so we don't have any uh, information on those organizations currently. Okay, so that'll be another great thing to, to look into, I think, since Mr. Kretz brings this up uh, um, and a adds to the conversation here. I think that's something that we, we need to uh, take a look at uh, as well. Uh, and, I, and I think for these reasons, and, and like I mentioned to everyone, who's attending today, uh, the Ark of Billy is well known and everyone cares about Billy. And everyone wants Billy to be healthy and be well. It's a matter of where, essentially. And so, even though I hate not moving this forward today so that we can just get on with it, uh, I think there are enough questions that have been brought up today that we have to hold it. But just know that there's a sense of urgency that, Ms. and Mr. Rue stated it, very clearly, transparent without a, a perception of any bias. That's of tantamount importance to everyone here. Uh, and so um, that, that is the element that I would like to um, uh, be ever present in this entire process. So uh, we'll hold this on, on the table, we'll hold this in, in committee uh, and the very first meeting in August that we can get it scheduled, we'll, we'll do so. Uh, so we'll do a, We'll do another 60 days, but we'll definitely hear this in August again. Uh, I, I would add, I, yes. I think both of our offices understand the sensitivity of this issue, and as uh, we go through this process, it, the intent really is to get a, a, as representative and um, as independent a, a panel as possible to, to review the is issue, and I think that's what we're we're committed to do to the extent that we can do that. So, uh, and that means that we'll we'll look at all possibilities and um, as we get together and um, work this through, we, we try to get a very representative panel. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Price. Any uh, anything to add, sir? Mr. Rue, we're good. All right. So that's what we'll do. And so let's let's be ready in 60 days. Within 60 days to. Uh, to follow up on this with um, the ins additional instructions. And I believe that brings us to our last item. All comment cards were finished with all items, and that means we are adjourned. Thank you so much.